Welcome to the inaugural Peter Underwood Peace and Justice Lecture at the Friends School. Before we begin, I just wanted to thank the high school trio for performing nice background music. This biennial event was conceived to honour Peter Underwood, best known for his service as Governor of Tasmania from 2008 until his death in 2014. Peter Underwood was also incredibly important to the Friends School as he served as presiding member of the Executive Committee of the school's Board of Governors during the 1990s. It was a difficult time for the school, as the buildings were in need of desperate repair just to remain standing. Peter helped to guide the school through this difficult time with clearness of thought, firmness of purpose and a passion for getting the job done. Promoting peace and justice were also important to Peter Underwood. As a Governor of Tasmania in 2013 and 2014, during his Anzac Day speeches, he sounded a note of caution against the glorification of war. Instead, he said we must all actively strive for peace on a daily basis and ask for the hard questions about the meaning of war, the causes of war, and war's real outcomes. These sentiments closely align with the Friends School's purposes and concern statements, which guides all that we do at the Friends School. As a measure to honour Peter Underwood, the Friends School has established this program, the Peter Underwood Peace and Justice Lecture. It is our greatest pleasure to introduce Professor Tim McCormack, who has travelled to Hobart to, with, to join us today to present this lecture. Tim is a professor of law at the Melbourne Law School and an adjunct professor of law at the University of Tasmania Law School. He is the special advisor on international humanitarian law to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, the law of armed conflict expert advisor to the ADF Director of Military Prosecutions in Canberra and a director of World Vision Australia. Tim has developed an international reputation for his expertise in international humanitarian law and in international criminal law. He is also a graduate of the University of Tasmania and subsequently of Monash University. In 2003, he was awarded the University of Tasmania Foundation Outstanding Graduate Award. In 2005, Tim was also awarded the President of the Law Institute of Victoria's Pro Bono Award and in 2008, he received the Law Institute of Victoria's Paul Baker Award for his sustained outstanding contribution to international humanitarian and human rights law through publication, teaching, and public advocacy. In 2010, Tim was appointed a fellow of the Australian Acad Academy of Law. Tim developed Australia's first graduate coursework specialisation in international humanitarian law and an internationally unique specialist coursework graduate program in military law both at the University of Melbourne. Tim was the National Vice President of Australian Red Cross from 1999 to 2002 and chaired the Australian Red Cross National Advisory Committee on International Humanitarian Law from 1994 to 2002. In 2001, he was awarded the Australian Red Cross Medal for Outstanding Volunteer Service to the organisation. In 2014, he was also awarded the Australian Red Cross Distinguished Service Medal for more than 20 years of voluntary commitment to the promotion of understanding of and respect for international humanitarian law. He has participated in Australian government delegations to multilateral treaty negotiations in New York, Geneva, The Hague and Rome. He provides expert international legal advice to various Australian government departments and has delivered conference papers in many countries. Tim was recently awarded a Fulbright Senior Scholarship to take up the prestigious position of Charles H. Stockton Distinguished Scholar in Residence in the Stockton Centre for the Study of International Law at the US Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Tim will be only the second Australian to be appointed since 1953 when the position was first created. Tim will take up the position in August 2015 until June 2016. Whilst he's in the US, Tim has also been appointed visiting professor at Harvard Law School to teach international criminal law in the winter term of January 2016. So, without further ado, please welcome our inaugural guest speaker, Tim McCormack, to the stage. Without further ado, Annie, I mean, good, there was perhaps too much ado. <laughs> but thank you very much for such a, a fulsome introduction. And it's a great honour for me to be here with you in the Farrell Centre at Friends to deliver this inaugural 
Peter Underwood lecture. Peter, uh, like so many other Tasmanians, I held in the highest esteem. As a jurist, as governor of this state, as a man of the people, and as a person committed to peace and justice. For me, it's a very special honour to present this lecture at Friends to the senior students and to other distinguished guests and McCormack family members. I was reflecting on my association with Friends over the decades. In the 1970s, my brother Jim, who's with us today, was a resident tutor in the boarding school here and even before I moved from our hometown of Burnie to Hobart to study at the university here, I visited him in the boarding house and that was the first time I ever really understood anything about the Friends School. A little bit more recently, although for you students it will still f seem like the dim, dark past, but for the last 25 years I've had two different bases for uh, my relationship with the school. The first of them is because of my family's uh, friendship with Miriam Berkeley and her family. Miriam, as you know, is the head of art here at Friends. She first started here in 1991, the same year that I started uh, as an academic at the University of Melbourne. And throughout that entire period, as we have visited Hobart and stayed with her family, we've learnt a lot about the Friends School. But it was about the same time in the early 1990s that I had a student from Melbourne Law School, a then young Jeremy Farrell, come to speak to me in my office about his passion for studying international law and human rights. And he and I became good friends. He did some research assistance for me and I followed his career with interest. And through my friendship with him, I also became friends with his family, especially with Lindsay and Stephanie. They hosted our family for lunch in the residence here we borrowed their shack on Bruny Island. They probably don't even remember that, but it was very generous of them to allow us to use it. And we've stayed in contact through Jeremy and my ongoing friendship. And so it's very special for me to be at Friends, to be invited to deliver this lecture. And in terms of the subject matter of it, I understand absolutely that the values of the school are so consistent with the values that Peter Underwood espoused and that we have made the subject of this special lecture series to honour his memory. So let me just say a few things about my relationship with Peter Underwood. He was at the bar here in Tasmania uh, when I first moved from Burnie to Hobart to study law. And he was appointed Justice of the Supreme Court after I'd left to move to Melbourne to undertake my graduate study. But while he was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court from 2004 to 2008, I taught his and Mrs Underwood's son William um, here in Tasmania in the summer school that I taught at the University of Tasmania and then subsequently at Melbourne Law School when Will came over to do his master's degree with us. I was his referee when he applied to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and while he was working in Tasmania as the Australian Red Cross International Humanitarian Law Officer for the state, he and I had lots to do with each other as I delivered public lectures for him uh, and for the Red Cross. And then through my friendship with Will, I met um, both Peter and Francis at Government House at various receptions, at University of Tasmania Law School events, and also when um, Peter as governor would come down on a regular basis to the law school down in Sandy Bay to help out with, um, with training and advocacy and uh, moot court preparation. I admired Peter's approach to the governorship very, very much and was particularly impressed not only with his commitment to justice as a lawyer, as a judge and as governor with different contributions to make to the justice system in Tasmania, but also to his commitment to peace. Much has been said, not just by Luke and Annie, but in the press about Peter's 2013 and 2014 Anzac Day speeches at the Cenotaph here in Hobart. He served in Vietnam as a conscript in the Navy and he witnessed some of the horrors of war personally. 
So he came to the Cenotaph with some authority, not speaking academically about the subject. And he challenged our tendency to mythologize Gallipoli and to downplay the horrors not only of that campaign, but also of the campaign particularly on the Western Front that claimed so many lives on both sides of the conflict. Peter challenged our tendency to mythologize Gallipoli. He also questioned the extraordinary public expenditure plan for this year's centenary anniversary of the Gallipoli landing, rather than diverting some of those resources to efforts at preventing conflict. He wondered aloud whether we glorify an unrealistic notion of the Aussie digger at the expense of reflecting on why our politicians seem so ready to send our nation's armed forces off to war. And then so many service members return with post-traumatic stress and other mental illnesses. For me, it's right and proper that the memory of Peter Underwood be honoured by a public lecture focusing on peace and justice. And I'm thrilled to be invited to inaugurate that lecture series. The title that I gave to my presentation today is this, No Peace Without Justice or No Justice Without Peace? Which comes first? And the answer to that question really depends upon our understanding of these two key concepts, peace and justice. So let me start with the first of them, peace. If you were to search for a def definition of the, of the term, you would find one option as an absence of conflict. And conflict can be terminated a number of different ways. A negotiated ceasefire agreement, a peace treaty between warring sides, a comprehensive defeat by one side of the other, or sometimes even a unilateral retreat by one party to the conflict. There are a number of different ways that, that war or conflict can end, and then we say we have a situation of peace. Now that definition is technically accurate, but it's also very narrow, and we understand, I'm sure, that peace is a much broader concept than merely the absence of conflict. Would anybody really try to say that Nepal today is a peaceful place? There is no armed um, conflict going on. There certainly has been in the past, but it's been resolved by peace agreement between the sides. And what racks Nepal is the aftermath of a devastating earth earthquake, a desperate lack of humanitarian aid with tremors and aftershock quakes going on multiple times a day. There is tremendous fear in that country and huge challenges to get humanitarian assistance desperately needed just for survival out to inaccessible and remote parts of the city, I heard, parts of the country. I heard on the radio this morning that planes are unable to land because of, because of uh, the disruption that's been caused to the airstrip uh, in Kathmandu, and there are huge challenges there. But it's not about the fact that there is armed conflict, and yet it is a desperately unpeaceful place. I also think in this context about a narrow understanding of what we mean by peace, the absence of conflict, uh, in terms of the Israeli-Egyptian conflict, which was finally resolved after multiple decades in 1978, with the negotiation of a peace treaty signed by President Anwar Sadat of Egypt and by Prime Minister Menachem Begin of Israel. I remember having the privilege at the end of 1981 of travelling on a study mission to Egypt and Israel as a recent graduate from the law school in Hobart. And we had various conversations in both Egypt and Israel about the state of the bilateral relations between the two countries. And a number of times on both sides, we heard the expression, cold peace. The war is over, the enmity between us has stopped, but we are not the best of friends. And the best that we can say is the conflict has ended, but this is hardly a warm friendship. There had been an exchange of diplomatic relations, there'd been a resumption of trade, but there was still a lot of work to do to establish trust and goodwill between those two countries. As we think about peace in a broader context, there are many disruptions to peace apart from 
war and the outbreak of hostilities. Natural disasters, economic hardship, poverty, serious illness, the death of a loved one. Think about the things that disrupt our own peaceful experience of life. So we come to a second, much broader meaning of the term peace. We understand peace to be a state of mind, a lack of anxiety, a state of contentment, quietness, stillness, an acceptance of who we are, the circumstances in which we're free to be ourselves, the freedom to live our lives as we choose, to love our families, to practice our faith or our own value systems. Yesterday, I went for a walk up Mount Wellington with my son Jacob, and we just started off on the uh, lower sawmill track to join up to the Lena Valley track, and uh, he said at one particular point, it's so peaceful. It was a very still afternoon yesterday, no wind, even on the summit. It was just a zephyr up there when you, we've all experienced roaring gales. It was a very peaceful afternoon. Of course, we were talking about the circumstances, the beauty in the vegetation, the fact that there was no one else apart from he and I on the track for most of the, the walk up there, uh, just the, the circumstances of fresh air and having a break from congested inner city Melbourne. It was a peaceful place. We often associate peace with place, with a particular view, with the mountains, the beach, the botanical gardens, wherever else. Somewhere where we're just content to be in the moment and understand that there's nowhere we'd rather be. And we can think about this on multiple levels, us as individuals, as families, as streets or neighbourhoods, as communities, as a peaceful nation. Let me, uh, let me move to talk about justice and then I want to come back to discuss the relationship between these two concepts. We accept that there's a narrow and a much broader understanding of peace. We can say exactly the same about justice. On one level, when we use the term justice, we can mean the guilt or innocence of an individual accused. A trial process happens if the accused is convicted, then there's, a, there's the awarding of a sentence. If the accused is acquitted, then, of course, they are entitled to their freedom. How many times does the media report justice was done or, or justice wasn't done today at the end of a high public profile criminal trial. There will often be interviews with the victim or with the victim's family if there's a deceased member or with the accused lawyer who will have their own view on whether what's just happened constituted justice or didn't constitute justice. We think in this narrow term of accountability and punishment for wrongdoing. Sometimes we talk about the justice system and here we're speaking more broadly than the process of the particular individual criminal trial. We're talking about the legislature, which has responsibility for determining what is acceptable conduct and what is not through the passage of legislation. We include uh, the police force and law enforcement powers. We include the prosecution who determines who will be charged and with what offences. We include the courts and the judiciary who have the responsibility to administer our justice system and to enforce the law. And we also include corrections and the prison system to incarcerate those who are awarded a custodial sentence. But just as with peace and a narrow understanding of that concept, it's also true that there is a much broader view of justice than the one that I've already described. There are multiple levels of justice just as there are for peace and we always need to be clear about what we mean by justice. Justice for whom? Are we talking about justice for the individual perpetrator? Are we talking about justice for the individual victim or the victim's family? Are we talking about justice for the local community, for the state or for the nation, or even for the international community on the global level? There is also this much broader meaning of justice about treating people fairly and equitably as they deserve to be treated, about a non-discriminatory approach to how we treat other people and for taking a stand against examples of injustice. Sometimes we speak about transformative or 
restorative justice rather than a simple punitive or retributive approach to justice. We speak about social justice, about uh, inequitable distribution of resources, about disparity in the measures of social health. We certainly think about this in relation to our Indigenous brothers and sisters in Australia. If we compare them to the rest of the country in terms of basic indices like life expectancy, infant mortality, literacy, rates per capita of incarceration, there are huge disparities, huge injustices in the massive disparity that, that applies to our Indigenous people. And in Nepal right now, there are also serious examples of injustice in relation to the distribution of aid. There are uh, allegations and suggestions of corruption, of uh, obstruction, of equitable distribution of aid, of aid only going to certain castes in preference to others or to particular tribal groups. So even in that context, we can think about justice in a much broader way. So let me move to thinking about the relationship between peace and justice. And here I have to be selective. I have to choose some particular levels of the concepts to discuss. And I'd like, because of my own personal experience, to focus on peace and justice at the global level and then come back at the end of this lecture to talk about what this might mean for you senior students here at Friends School. If I think about peace in the narrow sense of the term, the absence of conflict, it's hard to contemplate dealing with justice issues at a global level while the bullets or the shells are still flying. So it's true in one sense that peace, the cessation of hostilities, is a precondition to be able to move on and deal with justice issues arising out of a conflict situation. Some people would go further though and to say not only is it a precondition, it's always the highest priority that peace trumps justice, that accountability should never obstruct negotiation of a peaceful settlement or a resolution to a conflict. And that, I think, can be quite complicated because often when we're trying to, as an international community, work towards peaceful resolution of a conflict, the very individuals that are essential to sign the peace agreement to terminate hostilities are the same people from a justice perspective we would want to hold accountable for atrocities they've allegedly perpetrated. So I think of, as an illustration of the Dayton Accords in 1995, which concluded the very complex and terrible conflicts in the Balkans, in Croatia, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, in Serbia, in Kosovo. The reality then was that Slobodan Milosevic, as the president of Serbia, and Radovan Karadzic, as the, self, as, the, as the president of the self-declared Bosnian Serb Republic in Bosnia, were two of the people accused of a whole raft of atrocities, particularly against Bosnian and Herzegovina and Muslims. And yet they were fundamental to any negotiation, to a peaceful settlement of a conflict that had raged in that part of the world since 1991. The conflict had culminated in uh, July of 1995 with the Srebrenica massacre, the worst single atrocity perpetrated in Europe since World War II, with between seven and 8,000 Bosnian Muslim men between the age of 16 and 55 systematically assassinated and buried in mass graves. And the allegations were that Milosevic and, 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 and Karadzic were personally responsible for the Srebrenica massacre. When Radovan Karadzic was finally uh, discovered in uh, having taken on a new persona as a, uh, as a practitioner of alternative medicine, grown a long beard, changed his physical appearance and his name, he was discovered and handed over for trial in The Hague. He claimed in the preliminary hearing that Richard Holbrook, the US, uh, US ambassador for the negotiation of the Dayton Accords, had promised him that if he signed the Dayton Accords and helped terminate the conflict in the Balkans, all he had to do then was go off into hiding and leave public office 
and he would never be held accountable. We would, be, we would, as an international community, give him immunity from prosecution. That was something Richard Holbrook was not authorised to promise, and the Yugoslav Tribunal ignored the uh, allegation made by Radovan Karadic. But the interesting thing about it is that Karadic did exactly that. He signed the accords, he went into hiding, he changed his name and his, uh, and, and his uh, physical appearance and still he was held accountable. It, it, there are challenging issues about how we, uh, how we construct the relationship between peace and justice after decades of conflict. I also remember by way of illustration, howls of protest, including from UN headquarters in New York, when the then prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Luis Moreno Ocampo from Argentina, issued an arrest warrant against the incumbent president of Sudan Omar al-Bashir for his alleged international criminal court crimes in the Darfur region in the west of Sudan. President Bashir had exercised Sudanese sovereignty and chosen not to become a state party to the Rome Statute. And here, the prosecutor was purporting to claim that he had the authority to issue an arrest warrant against the president. The basis of the House of protest in New York had nothing to do with allegations in respect of what had gone on in the Darfur region in the west of Sudan, but the fact that the UN was trying to negotiate a peace settlement for the conflict still raging in the south of Sudan. And how dare this upstart prosecutor issue an arrest warrant against the very person we need to sign the peace agreement to make sure that we achieve peace in the south. It's uh, sometimes a challenge to try to find the balance. Mr Ocampo, the prosecutor's attitude to all of that, was that my responsibility is to act on the evidence I have before me. And if the UN Security Council believes that by issuing an arrest warrant against an incumbent president, I'm upsetting international peace and security or efforts at trying to secure international peace, then it is for the Security Council to step in and preclude me from acting, which the Security Council never chose to do. So I'm conceding here that there is some tension in the narrower version of peace as the absence of conflict and justice in terms of holding accountable those who have allegedly perpetrated atrocities. And people will disagree about which of those is most important. But if we move beyond those narrow understandings of the terms to a broader understanding of peace and justice, then we start to see a more comprehensive, holistic view of the relationship between these two concepts. And we can see that there's less tension between them and in fact, they are complementary to each other. Sometimes we've uh, learnt from our experience in the International Criminal Justice Project, as I describe it, over the last 22 years, as various international criminal courts and tribunals have been set up to deal with this, that some communities that have experienced atrocity against whom wrongs have been perpetrated desperately need acknowledgement of the wrongs and accountability for those who have perpetrated the wrongs to be able to move on to live the sorts of peaceful lives, the broader understanding of what peace really means, encapsulate. And here the passage of time doesn't seem to dull or diminish the pleas for justice. This year we've celebrated or we've commemorated the centenary anniversary of the Gallipoli landing, but 2015 is the centenary of some other major events. It's the centenary of the first use on a massive scale of chemical warfare in the world with uh, phosgene and mustard gas resulting in 1.3 million casualties on the Western Front, 300,000 fatalities and 1 million wounded who returned home on both sides of the conflict with damage to their lungs and to their esophagus and breathing, uh, breathing systems, many of them to die prematurely as a consequence of their ingestion of gas. This year is also the centenary anniversary of the Armenian massacres at the hands of the Ottomans. The Armenians were a minority group in the Ottoman Empire and they were forced from their ancestral mountain homes uh, to other parts of the, uh, of the uh, empire. 
And to this day, the Armenian people lament the failure of the international community to acknowledge that what they experienced as a group of people constituted genocide, at least genocide as it was subsequently defined in 1948 in the Convention Against Genocide. Turkey refuses to accept that this constituted genocide, even though the Armenians were targeted on the basis of their ethnicity, which is a, a basis for the perpetration of genocide as we now understand that crime. And in Australia's case, officially, we refuse to recognise Armenian suffering as genocide. Despite fighting against Turkey in World War I, we actually have very good bilateral relations with them now. There are many more Turks in Australia than there are Armenians. And the Turks care for Anzac Cove and for our war graves at Gallipoli. And no Australian government of either political persuasion wants to prejudice the importance and significance of that in the bilateral relationship with Turkey. So we refuse to formally recognise that what happened to the Armenians constituted genocide. And the Armenian people, even after 100 years, are still aggrieved, not just by Australia's failure to recognise this atrocity, but also by the failure of many other governments who happen to have good bilateral relations with Turkey. Think about the passage of time not dulling the pain of the wrongs that have been perpetrated in terms of the Australian government's apology in 2007 to Indigenous Australia for the stolen generations, for those Aboriginal children who were taken from their families and placed into white foster care and into white um, homes in the hope that they would assimilate into white society. And finally, when the apology came, so many people of our Indigenous peoples were able to say this is a breakthrough moment because we've been longing for acknowledgement of the wrong done to us. Let's move to more contemporary times in relation to this same question. There is some fascinating empirical research being undertaken from the Balkans conflicts from 1991 right through until the Kosovo conflict in 1999 which confirms that those communities in Serbia, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, in the Bosnian-Serb Republic, in Serbia itself, in, uh, in Kosovo, those, experience, those communities which experienced accountability through trials for alleged perpetrators of atrocity are much better placed to move on with their lives, to rebuild their communities, to face the future with greater confidence without the cloud of unresolved heartache as a consequence of atrocities perpetrated in the past, compared to those communities which have not experienced the same thing. In my work in The Hague, the International Criminal Court has been created to challenge impunity for atrocity, to hold at least some individuals accountable for genocide, for crimes against humanity and for war crimes. And I'm thrilled today to have Bridget Dunn here, who was my uh, research assistant in The Hague for 12 months just a couple of years ago and did a fantastic job for me over there. Tasmanians uh, have made a great contribution to the work of the court and Bridget's a terrific example of that. This for the court is a, an important and laudable goal and I'm pleased to contribute to it but there are some major limitations to what an institution like the International Criminal Court can achieve. First of all, for every trial that the court undertakes, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of others who deserve to be tried for their alleged involvement in those three categories of crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. Secondly, the, the whole process of the International Criminal Court is a punitive process to hold individuals accountable for their involvement in atrocities and not necessarily restorative or at, at all, restorative or transformative for the societies that have been subjected to these atrocities. In addition to the International Criminal Court, there's still a place for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission process at the national level where wrongs are acknowledged and individuals who've participated in the perpetration of those wrongs uh, have, are given an opportunity to, to concede or to acknowledge that they were certainly involved. And another limitation of the International Criminal Court is that it's reactive 
it only becomes operative after the event when the atrocity has actually occurred. If, as an international community, we were really serious about preventing atrocity, we'd allocate way more resources, both financial and human, to preventing the outbreak of conflict in the first place. And here I think Peter Underwood's comments in those Anzac Day speeches are absolutely spot on. Here I think the values of the Friends School and the Quaker movement are entirely appropriate and, and, and should be applauded. So much more effort that went into preventing conflict in the first place would be, would be much more significant than trying to deal with the aftermath of it when it's all too late. I'm very grateful on this subject for my involvement in the Board of World Vision because the organisation, both in Australia and globally, is trying to work to help communities lift themselves out of poverty and perhaps to help prevent conflict occurring. That's a proactive approach to justice, to prevent the need for a reactive and punitive approach to justice. So all of this, I mean, perhaps it would be easy for senior students at the school to think, well, this is only all relevant at the global level. And unless you happen to be the Tim Hawkins Memorial Scholar from the University of Tasmania, going off to work with a special advisor on international humanitarian law at the International Criminal Court, what, what prospect is there for me to be engaged in these great concepts of peace and justice? I think it's too easy to just dismiss it on the basis of that. There are some real implications for all of us at the personal level, or at the, in your case, the school community level. What does it mean for you to be a person of peace and justice in this school community? Well, I've got to say to you, you've got a huge advantage in the ethos of the school, in the motto of the school, not made for self alone. The motto itself encapsulates, encapsulates an other-centred value. That from the Quaker movement, we believe that of God in all of us is a really great place to start in thinking about what it means to be a person of peace and justice. You are fortunate to be part of a school community that is already committed to peace and justice in other focused approach to a spirit of tolerance and acceptance and respect of the individual. So start with those values and practice them and don't engage in ostracism or bullying or teasing or judgment of others. Or if you see any of those examples of injustice, take a stand against them and I'm sure the school will only support you in it. Peter Underwood spoke of resolute commitment to peace. He demonstrated that himself. And if we are really keen, we can choose to pursue those same goals just as he did to commit ourselves to embody them in the way that we relate to others. And perhaps even in the school community, being involved or initiating collective activities to work for justice for those that lack what you and I so readily enjoy. Thanks very much for listening so well. I know that you had no choice, you year 10, <laughs> 11 and 12 students, about being here, but I'm very grateful for such riveted attention. Thank you. And uh, I hope that we've got a little bit of time for question and answers because I'd be really keen to hear from you. So, thank you. Anyone brave enough to kick us off? Further, further corner possible. I can see that oh, hand. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's a great question, and thanks for being able to project your voice well enough for me to hear. Perhaps it's the Farrell Centre's Outstanding Acoustics. It's a great question and uh, it's very true that the criticism has been 
relentless. It's growing, I think, as the, uh, particularly against the International Criminal Court as the, as the court continues with its work because so far in the eight country situations that the court is investigating or conducting trials in relation to, all of them are from Africa. So it, it's quite easy to make the allegation that the court is somehow or other biased against Africa. And maybe that's just too easy for the court to deal only with African conflicts. The current prosecutor, um, Fatou Ben Souda from the Gambia, is a formidable African woman, and I've heard her respond to that criticism, and I have to say, it's pretty impressive when she's in full flight defending the institution of the court. Her position is that the criticism is unfair on this basis, that four of those eight country situations constitute self-referrals where the governments of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, the Central African Republic and Mali, all states parties to the Rome Statute, have come to the prosecutor of the court and said, we are struggling to deal with the, conf uh, with the, with the justice issues arising out of the conflicts that have racked our countries, in some cases, in the case of the DRC, for more than 20 years. Please help us. And so the prosecutor has, of course, responded to those approaches because the court was set up to deal precisely with situations where, at the national level, there is a lack of ability or a lack of willingness to deal with the justice issues um, by, the, by, the, by the processes and structures uh, in the country concerned. So four of those countries are asking for help. Two of them have been referred to the uh, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court by the UN Security Council. So the council has said in relation to Darfur in Sudan and also in relation to the conflict in Libya, the prosecutor has jurisdiction, well, sorry, the court has jurisdiction and the prosecutor is authorised to investigate situations involving alleged ICC crimes. So six out of eight have come to the court by way of requests, four from the countries themselves, two from, from the UN Security Council all African situations. The final two have come by way of the prosecutor exercising his or her own initiative. And they, they relate to Kenya and to the Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast on the west, western um, rump of Africa. Now in both of those cases, the Kenyan authorities came to the then prosecutor, Mr Ocampo, and said, it's politically unacceptable for us to self-refer the situation in Kenya uh, but if you were to undertake your own initiative, we would cooperate fully with you. So please go and do that and help us out. Well, I mean, of course he said, oh, happy to, I'm happy to do that. The eighth situation, so seven out of eight are still sort of requests for assistance from the court. The eighth one, in Cote d'Ivoire, the prosecutor clarified with the authorities in the capital Abidjan about whether or not the declaration that the authorities had made a few years earlier accepting the jurisdiction of the court was still valid. And the authorities confirmed that it was, and so the prosecutor acted on the basis of that with the full cooperation uh, to date of the authorities in that country. So eight out of eight situations are uncontroversial from the perspective of each of the countries involved, although the politics have changed on the ground in Kenya and now Kenya's a huge critic of the court. But I think the prosecutor's right that it's not the situation that the court has been going after the easy cases in Africa. That's where the request for help came from. But I also accept that this court was not set up for the continent of Africa. It was set up for conflicts, at least theoretically, wherever they occur in the world. And you're absolutely right to ask the question or to imply in the question that the court is yet to deal with a first world situation. And until it does, there will be a question mark over its credibility as an independent institution. There are three situations that the court, or at least the office of the prosecutor is currently undertaking preliminary examinations of, all of which involve first world players. They are Georgia, Afghanistan and Palestine. Now, I mention those because in the case of Georgia, Georgia is a state party to the Rome Statute, but the Russians, you'll remember some of you, perhaps the Russian invasion of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, two of the provinces on the northern border of Georgia and, and Russia. The court has jurisdiction over alleged international criminal court crimes occurring on the physical territory of a state party. 
even if nationals of non-states parties are involved in that conflict. And Russia is not a state party, Georgia is. So we have jurisdiction over the acts of Russian forces in South Ossetia and Abkhazia. On exactly the same basis, we also have jurisdiction over the nationals of non-states parties on the physical territory of Afghanistan, and that includes US forces in Bagram Air Base, for example, where there are allegations of systematic detainee abuse and torture. The Americans are not happy about that, by the way. The third situation, Palestine, because Palestine has become a state party to the Rome Statute, the court has jurisdiction after the 1st of April this year over the physical territory of the Gaza Strip and the occupied um, West Bank of the Jordan River. And the Israelis are not a state party and they are very, well, upset, that's understatement. They're furious about the fact that the Palestinians have done this. The next four or five years, a critical period for the court, in my view, to determine whether it can be an independent organisation in relation to situations like that, where if there are allegations of international criminal court crimes being perpetrated by non-states parties who are major players in the developed world, then, uh, then, then, I mean, it will be controversial, but it's really important to the credibility of the court. If we shy away from that as an institution, we'll lose our credibility. If we take it on, we might get wound up and terminated. And if that happens, I'd rather it be on the basis that the court stood up for issues of principle and went down as an institution than for it to wither on the vine because it was unprepared to take on some difficult cases. So let's have the conversation again in about five years' time, perhaps just after you've graduated from university, and uh, we'll see whether we, whether we did the right thing or not as an institution. Thanks, great question. Because if I take that long to answer it, there's not many questions left, are there? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Try and be quicker next time. Lindsay, Mr Farrell. Thank you very much. Tim, for your lecture. I found it very fascinating and I learnt a lot that I hadn't known about before. It's my impression, and this may be just a fond father, that Australians and Tasmanians contribute a lot more uh, to peace and justice in the way you've talked about it than many peoples from other countries. Am I right or not? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Thank you, Lindsay. And I'm biased about this. It doesn't mean that I'm wrong, but, uh, but, but Bridget will attest to the fact that there are a lot of questions asked in The Hague, in the International Criminal Court in particular, about all these Tasmanians who are so fascinated by and committed to international peace and justice. The previous prosecutor, Mr Ocampo, I said, I've got to, next time I come to Australia, I've got to go to Tasmania. I can't work out. How many people you say live there? Less than half a million. How is it possible that so many Tasmanians end up in a place like this? And that's also true not just of the International Criminal Court, of the other International Criminal Courts and Tribunals, but of the UN itself. As you well know, Jeremy's made some great contributions himself there and so have other compatriots of his and mine, former Tasmanians. I'm not sure what the answer is. I don't think it's just the purity of the air. Perhaps it is that as an island state in an island continent, we are outward looking. Um, or maybe it's also because there is, a, there is a warmth in the hearts of the people of the heart-shaped island, the way we embraced the Kosovar Albanians that were here back in the uh, late 1990s. My brother John had some major responsibility with the Tasmania police at the time for running the, the camp out of Brighton. And I went out with him one day and I was just gobsmacked by the warmth that these people had for him and for the Tasmanian community because of our acceptance of them. There are many people in this state outraged and distressed by successive Commonwealth Government policies in relation to asylum seekers who would love to welcome them here. I think Mary Meets Muhammad is a magnificent documentary account of 
a sort of symptom of that, an example of that. And I think that that's a tremendous export of this island state of ours. Uh, it's a pity it doesn't make a difference to the economic bottom line, because if it did, we'd probably take it more seriously as a society. But, yeah, I'm conscious of it. I've seen plenty of examples of it. I'm not sure I can comprehensively explain it, but it's a beautiful thing, and I hope it continues into the future. Thanks for the question. Uh, in, in The Hague in June, if anyone happens to be planning to be there for the last week of June, there'll be a public lecture with the title From the Netherlands to Van Diemen's Land and Back Again, a Tasmanian Contribution to Global Justice, and I'm going to talk about the Tim Hawkins Memorial Scholarship. So you'll get another mention in absentia, Bridget, but so will the others who've been part of that program. Uh, you'll be most welcome to come along. I don't know the venue or the precise date, but you know, hey, we can work these things out, can't we? Year 12 excursion to the Hague, that'd be a top idea. <laughs> Any other questions? Sorry, I didn't see that. I was looking up the top. <laughs> Do you? Hello? Okay. Um, in relation to the recent Bali 9 executions, yeah. what do you think about Australia condemning Indonesia for the infringement of human rights? Thanks, thanks very much for the question. I think we should first of all take a good hard look at ourselves. The question that I would want to ask in response first up is, how is it that we have legislation which precludes us extraditing an Australian, oh sorry, someone in Australian custody, not necessarily an Australian national, to another foreign government where that person could face the death penalty. We refuse to extradite on that ground. It's an exception to our normal extradition arrangements. And yet, our Australian Federal Police can tip off the Indonesian authorities about some Australians who are engaged in drug smuggling, knowing the consequences for that offence in Indonesia is a death penalty. I find that extraordinary, and I'm glad that the Australian Federal Police has changed its policy in relation to that in uh, 2009, un unannounced at the time, but now it's become clear in, in the media scrutiny that's been applied. I also want us as a nation to ask ourselves about what our view really is of the death penalty. We've abolished it by legislation here, but if we're really serious about opposing it, then we should be opposing it not just in relation to Indonesia or Singapore or Thailand, but the United States as well, and we need to let our close allies know that we're opposed to it for Australians, and I think that means being much more proactive about, um, about protesting about the possibility of it very early on when a person's convicted. There's no question that both Andrew Chan and Myron Sukumarin uh, were engaged in, in, in drug trafficking. It wasn't a question of possession, but of trafficking because of the amount that they had in their possession. And obviously they should be punished for that offence. The tragic thing about it, of course, is that after 10 years in prison, they were thoroughly rehabilitated. That's, I mean, something working in the Indonesian prison system, ironically, which should be recognised and perhaps studied. But for fellow inmates to offer to die themselves in place of these two because of the love that they had for them and the appreciation for the contribution they'd made in their life, that is an extraordinary thing. I and mean, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked to learn that, that there is a whole stack of people in the same prison system who would gladly have, have gone themselves to the firing squad in place of those two guys. It says a lot about their rehabilitation. And this, for me, is one of the tragedies of the death penalty because despite them receiving a conviction which was due to them and them serving 10 years in prison, they have not been given an opportunity to go on to continue to make a contribution, not just to society at large, but an educative contribution, perhaps in Indonesia and here, against drug trafficking. But uh, that opportunity is lost. So, yes, I mean, it's, it's tragic circumstances and situation, and uh, I hope that this Australian government and any future one of different political persuasion 
thinks a little bit more about being proactive earlier on in the process rather than what seems to be uh, much too late when the tide of public opinion and the media turned against the Indonesian authorities. Thanks for the question. Got time for one more, Luke, or not? Just as an addendum to your um, response, um, the Senate, uh, I don't know whether it's the Standing Committee or, or the other committee, um, had the um, Australian Federal Police reply to exactly what you were just saying about the tip-off and they made the Indonesian authorities aware. He justified that this morning in the Senate, in the Senate inquiry. So he was saying that that had been outlawed um, in 2009, is that correct? Or? Yeah, uh, not, I don't think outlawed is the right term. It was a change of policy. It's not, it's not legislatively enshrined. It's not an offence for the AFP to, to tip off a foreign government which could lead to the arrest, conviction and subsequent execution of an Australian national. But the policy has been changed, apparently. I mean, I haven't seen the written policy, but I understand the policy has been changed that uh, we, will, we will not be involved in, in providing the same information we would normally do in the context of our bilateral relationship if, as a consequence of that, a person could face execution. Instead, we'll wait until they get on the plane, arrive in Australia, arrest them and try them here. And if that had happened, both those two guys would have served time in prison, would have been released. Whether or not they'd been rehabilitated in Australian prison is entirely you know, speculative. Uh, we'll never know, will we? But yeah, thanks. Luke, come do your stuff. Let's now finish in silence.